Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, no wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs of God. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicums? I was never a good reader. Ah, uh, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? You're not even supposed to use the word fact. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hello, and it's great to have you with us for another audiobook podcast from Square Sound. I'm Abby Holmes. And I'm Justine Sloan-Lees. So in this podcast, we're taking you back in time to look at the history of audiobook production, which actually goes back over 100 years. In fact, when Thomas Edison invented the phonograph in 1877, the first thing he recorded was Mary Had a Little Lamb. And he anticipated recorded books as read by elocutionists to have a great future. So, Justine, you'll be talking to an old buddy, Jennifer Bowen, who I would like to introduce and then hand the floor over to you two. Yes, indeed. Jennifer and I work together at the ABC. Dr Jennifer Bowen is a radio producer and academic. Her first post was at Radio 2XX in Canberra, followed by 20 years on staff at the BBC in the UK. Since returning to Australia, she's produced features for ABC Radio National, as well as podcasts, and she teaches radio journalism at Monash Uni. She earned her doctorate a few years back with a thesis that looked at the history of early radio in Australia through the prism of its spoken word output with things like book and poetry readings included. So welcome, Jennifer, and take it away, Justine. Jennifer, I'm so thrilled that you could join us in the studio to have this conversation about audiobooks and the history. It's an absolute pleasure, Justine. I've been interested in audiobooks as as a scholar, but as a listener for decades. Love them. Great. I thought to start with, maybe we need to step back from audiobooks and just go right back to the fact that storytelling has been such a fundamental part of human life since Homo sapiens gained speech quite some time ago. Oh, absolutely. And so far as there is any documentary record of this, it's absolutely clear from Homer and the notion that the first literary texts are, in fact, actually scripts of spoken words. And it's it's hearing stories being spoken aloud that's been a, a part of every culture, either through writing them down or through transmitting them from one generation to the next. And a crucial part in terms of special occasions and everyday occasions. Mm. So that hearing stories again, hearing familiar stories, stories again in different voices is a key part too of the way people retain a sense of tradition and their identity. Yeah, because we have the Icelandic sagas, we have the Aboriginal dreaming, we have in New Zealand the Māori whakapapa, which is where they learn their genealogy and their history. And so these stories, I think they help us make sense of the world and our place in it, and they entertain us and they instruct us. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say too um, that that you do often get built into particular cultural practices opportunities for the audience to to ask questions at key moments. And I mean, one of the key times would be the Jewish Passover celebration, the Seder, where there will be questions asked by young people or people around the table of other people. And it's that repetition of question and answer, stories that are known But it's the enactment of those stories and the participation in those stories that's so important for keeping a group together. So audiobooks per se, or let's call them talking books, which is what I think the original terminology was, as I understand, came about in the early 20s, partly as a response to all the servicemen who came back from the war with terrible injuries and very often blindness due to shrapnel wounds or the various gases that were used in chemical warfare, like mustard gas or tear gas. And that was a really key moment. Is that right? Absolutely. That was um, using discs, records, as we'd call them, LPs, to record stories. The problem was that the technology wasn't hugely developed, and so you could only record maybe three to five minutes per side. So a whole novel was going to be quite a weighty occasion, as you had a whole series of these quite fragile discs and obviously a little bit more expensive. But at the same time in the 1920s, radio 
began. Yes. And radio made a lot of use of stories, partly too because there was a practice at that time and even earlier for book readings to take place as public, almost yes. theatrical events. Like Mark Twain or Mark Charles Twain, Dickens. Charles Dickens, yeah, doing tours, reading from their novels, and people would go to theatres to hear those. And so it was a quite a quick move to have that kind of reading taking place as a public event, that's something that people would do to the radio. Using readers, there were people called elocutionists as part of the performing <laughs> arts circuit, I suppose, who wouldn't just read from novels but also read poems, read speeches sometimes. I mean, famous speeches from the past or sermons might be read. These people, the elocutionists, became one of the very first professional groups to appear on radio. There were musicians and elocutionists. And gradually, the elocutionists developed what they did, and so that by the early mid 30s, a storyteller was actually a fixed part of the people who were employed by a radio station. At one point, 2BL, I think in 1934, had four people called the official fictioneers, and they each had specialisms. I mean, well, I mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? One did historical novels, one did uh, the morning serial for women, uh, one did humorous stories, and one did Australian writing, which is quite interesting. Really? That's great. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think... Uh, as part of your doctorate, you researched the sort of ideas about using the radio and these voices on the radio as as a way of educating people who may not have had the opportunity to go to school. We're talking women often here, but um, it was really seen as a great social benefit for people. Look, I think it was seen as a benefit, but by the same token, it was also seen as a form of entertainment and a form of engagement with a particular voice. And in some ways, the storyteller on the radio for adults was was quite similar in what they did to the storytellers who presented the children's programs and quite routinely would read a bedtime story for children. At the time, there didn't seem to be anything amiss in having a story being read to adults. And of course, book readings did continue on the radio after the war, in fact, until 2013 in yes. Australia. <laughs> I was there when the ABC killed it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this was a, a very lengthy tradition. And, but there were some debates in the, in the 50s um, about whether it was appropriate for grown men to be listening to a storyteller. There, there'd been a bit of an issue at the time with the ABC where they'd moved their morning story from before nine till after 10. So it, it went into the slot that was associated with women's programs. And this caused some controversy in terms of the way the listenership responded. And it was as if men listeners didn't want to be listening to the women's program, but they did want to listen to stories. Consequence, about six months, a year later, the book reading went back to the morning before nine o'clock and everyone was happy. Which it was still there when I started producing them back, back in the days of audio cassettes. So audio cassettes were revolutionary because that was when we went from talking books on the radio to audio books as a thing that people could acquire and listen to at their leisure so they didn't have to turn on the radio at 8.45 to get that morning's episode. Absolutely. That made a huge difference because people could get them themselves. And the, the old days with the services for vision impaired people when you would have a great stack of LPs, which were, as I say, expensive, heavy, fragile. That was just revolutionised when cassette technology became available. Which was when? Remind me. I'm just trying to think because I think cassette technology was certainly part of everybody's lives in the 70s. People Absolutely. would make mixed tapes. They would put yes. their, their songs onto to tape. People were using recording technology from the 70s for learning languages, not just learning English as a second language, but people learning a, a language yes. to have on holidays. Yes. Teach yourself and French. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And so there was that much greater use of the spoken word in in a recorded form. They also would at times record letters, record them themselves, whether they were reading or simply improvising as they spoke to the, the cassette recorder. But these became a bit of a thing that, especially as more Australians were travelling overseas, perhaps young people, and there would be an exchange of recorded letters between families in Australia and people overseas. But the marketing of audiobooks kind of began around about that time. And there had always been the sense, too, that as well as vision-impaired people, there might be people in hospital or people who, for 
temporary periods of their lives, had time on their hands, but maybe weren't in a position to read books. And having a book read to you is is a great delight. Yes. It's, it's almost a gift mm. to have that voice in your ear. Mm. And so gradually the market began to develop with books for children and books for adults. Yes, I think there's other groups that it's worth mentioning who make use of audiobooks in a way that we probably don't. Children with dyslexia. Yes. It's great for children with dyslexia. It's very good for harried school mums whose teenage boys won't read set texts. My husband works in a public library where he's always got harried school mums coming in looking for the audiobook of whatever is on the syllabus for their 16-year-old boy that year because they figure that they've got more chance of getting him to listen while he does something else on his computer than to actually read a book. Also, people who struggle with literacy because I think that we tend to take literacy for granted and Australia has quite reasonable levels of literacy by world standards, but there are a lot of people for whom literacy is an issue on a day-to-day basis and particularly of the level Level that's required to engage with a book, with a novel, or with even an instruction manual or something, you know. And the audiobooks are really important for those people. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's no question that audiobooks have, have filled the needs of particular groups of people at particular times. Yeah. Somebody who is, who's learning a language, perhaps a yes. second language, um, hearing a book read and being able to go back and to well, hear it read again yes. and to hear the pronunciation of particular words, to hear how a voice can change because yep. oftentimes a solo reader will, will put on different voices and to hear those subtle changes as maybe uh, question and answer dialogues are repeated mm. is, is an enormous benefit to yes. somebody who's, who's coming to grips with the language. And so I think for periods of time, people listen to audiobooks. And then, of course, you have people who, who do become converted or they have a lifestyle that suddenly snaps with that. And I think one of the main developments too is the, the use of cassette recorders in cars yes. and the and development of commuting and long distance travel as being part of everybody's lives. And then, of course, I remember vividly when the Walkman became available and cassette recorders were all of a sudden portable and didn't require a massive pack of batteries or an electrical cable. And, you know, I remember sort of travelling in the mid-90s listening to music on the Walkman. It was amazing. Another group, I think, that engaged with audiobooks, this is something that's come to me recently with a beloved uncle who's unfortunately sliding into dementia. And the form it's taking for him is firstly, numbers began to really confuse him, but now letters and words confuse him. So he can't read a book anymore, but he can listen to the audiobook and he can follow it and engage with it and enjoy it. Um, going back to the English as a second language, when I ran a book reading program at the ABC, if the link for the podcast was broken, I always heard about it first from mainland China because I had obviously a huge uptake of podcasts from people in China who wanted to listen to readings of books. And I think that often they would have the actual text and they'd be able to follow the text and listen to the sound to try to make sense of all the various sounds of the language, the colloquial language. So I'd come in in the morning and there'd be emails from listeners in mainland China. Also, it's always been said here in Australia that long distance truck drivers are big consumers of audiobooks. And my brother, who does a lot of four wheel driving in the outback, he was converted to audiobooks a couple of years ago when he was in the back of beyond somewhere and went into a roadhouse and they had a rack of audiobooks for sale and he just thought, I'm really sick of music. And then when he got back, he said, we couldn't wait to get in the car each day to pick up the story. Yeah, and look, and that's a phenomenon that's been noticed around the world. And there has been research about truck drivers' listening habits to audiobooks in Europe. One of the universities in Denmark has looked very specifically at this. And they've had an interesting take insofar as they find very often too that truck drivers will become very fond of a particular voice mm. and they will actually seek out their subsequent listen, which they do with great enthusiasm, according to who the voice is yes. for the book rather than the author of the book or even the genre of the book. And that is a really fascinating thing, that what it is is being familiar with that voice, which is going to be the same and recognisable when it's reading another book. But it's also not quite the same. And if you're familiar with that 
reader, you might be able to tell that they're just that little bit tired or they're kind of buoyant and fresh. You can pick something of their mood at the time, or at least you think you can, according to the words. And that's something that's really interesting. What is it that you're really listening to mm. when you do listen to an audiobook? Are you listening to the words that the writer has prepared, or are you listening to the performance by that voice? That's very interesting you bring that up, because going back to my husband, a librarian in a public library, who I mentioned quite a bit, but he has a number of vision impaired clients who he's always trying to find new books for, and he has one particular client who will listen to anything as long as it's read by our mutual friend, David Tredinick. (laughs) <laughs> well, there you go. And this, for me, has always been interesting too because it links back to those very early days in the 1930s and 40s with radio where you had a fixed person yes. in the radio station alongside the sports producer uh, and, and somebody who was doing the, the music shows and so on. You had the storyteller. You had the same storyteller reading every book. And it was only really in the 40s, the late 40s and then into the 50s where you started to have a different book read by a different reader as it went on. So you have that voice for five or six weeks and then it's the next person. And you might have a pool of people who who did this sort of thing reasonably regularly, but all the same, you wouldn't expect to hear the same person maybe for another Mm -hmm. four or five months. Mm -hmm. So the next big technological change, of course, was CDs in the early 90s. And CDs, they contain around about the same amount of information as a cassette, but they're a bit more durable, less inclined to get the tape jammed around the spool, I find. Audiobooks started coming out then on CD and often it's still on cassette as well. Yeah, I, look, I don't know how significant the CD development was. I think it probably maintained the popularity of audiobooks rather than extending them. CDs were a little bit more expensive, if I remember rightly. Mm. And the CD players, they were called Discman, weren't Mm. they? Mm. And they worked reasonably well, but everybody knows what the Walkman is, but you say Discman uh, doesn't have quite the same (laughs) resonance. (laughs) Then it wasn't much longer before we had the next and the major technological transformation, which is the digital era, so MP3s. I think that made a huge difference in so many ways, and that really has caused the spiralling that's taken place. And also a big change, I think, because of the numbers, that you reach that critical mass, and then you have a much larger range of texts available. So some of the thinking that I have about the past is that people are listening on the whole to fiction. But one of the major changes that took place once digital technology was used is that you had non-fiction books um, being made available to people. And often books that were quite related to not, not so much topical events, but certainly situations of the moment, you know, even financial advice. You know, something that is going to date, you might only want to have that for a a year or so, and then there'll be a new edition or an update or a contrary view or whatever. But I think that's one of the major changes that has happened over the last 20 years, that such a range of material is made available through audio technology. Yes, we do record here a lot of leadership, entrepreneurship, business skills, that kind of thing. And I think going back to something you mentioned earlier about the time that people have to engage with this medium, you know, the commute to your office is a really good time to brush up on your uh, inter-office communication skills via an audio book. Yeah, I think that. And also, I mean, in some ways, people are doing more things on their own, perhaps. So going to the gym tends to be something that people do in a solitary way, in amongst a number of other people. And so they make that time absolutely their own by sticking on some headphones and listening to something. And I know that my son, who works in the business world, listens to a lot of material while he's at the gym, you know, doing his running and his weights and things that people do in gyms, and goes through huge numbers of books and then says afterwards, oh, I've read that, I've read this. And he hasn't actually read them on the page. He's heard them in his (laughs) ears, but has very good retention for, for what went on. Yeah. So do you have any kind of stats or figures you'd like to share about current (laughs) trends or...? Look, I'm interested in the media audio landscape as a whole and what's happening. A lot of the time now I'm teaching young people and there is a rather alarmingly dismissive attitude of live radio as being something, hey, who would listen to that? Mm. You ask them, (laughs) what do you know about radio listening? And they talk about, oh, well, my parents, but my grandparents, oh, yes, my grandparents, they listen to the radio. Anyway, Commercial Radio Australia, which is the industry body for the 
commercial radio sector, which is a huge sector in Australia financially and otherwise. They conducted some research at the end of 2019 looking at the overall media landscape, who was listening to what, and found that live radio actually holds up very well and something like two-thirds of the adult population listens to radio not just every week but every day and probably for a couple of hours every day. Wow. Yeah. Streaming audio it takes about 15% of the listenership. And audio books and podcasts are slightly lower down, but then they're they're rising, I suppose you could say. Podcast accounts for something like 7% of the adult population. It's not uh, clear exactly what sort of podcast they're listening to, but nonetheless, 7% of the population. And on the 2019 figures, something like 1.6% of all adult Australians do listen to audio books. Right. So it, it's a small percentage, but when you think about the adult population of Australia, mm. it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Mm. That's interesting. Going back to radio, are there places that still broadcast, as we mentioned, the ABC and their wisdom decided to drop uh, book readings in 2013? But I think the BBC still do, don't the they? The BBC still have a book reading every day called The Book at Bedtime, and it runs, I think it's at quarter to 11 till 11 o'clock every night, and is hugely popular. Partly possibly because quite big names will be reading the books, mm. so they are voices that the audience is familiar with. Yeah. So David Tennant mm. will read books, Judy Dench will read books, Juliet Stevenson reads books, Jolie Richardson reads books, Benedict Cumberbatch reads books, Stephen Fry, of course, does everything. Yes. He reads books. <laughs> so it's an opportunity to hear a voice that, that you know from film and television and indeed radio drama, but to hear them reading late in the evening in a way that is presented as being particularly intimate and for your ears only. But they are not the only broadcasting outlet that are broadcasting book readings, if you like, audio books at the moment. You certainly find it in parts of North America and you find it in Asia. Really? Um, yeah, I've been asking my students who come from all over the world what the experience is of hearing a media voice where they come from. And audio books are a big thing in China, a very big thing in China, and also in Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia. In fact, in China, there has been some research done on the way audio books have become part of the digital modernity of China now. And a lot of audio books in China are not really so much for recreation, but they're much more for studying. They're for business advice and the idea that these will improve you, that these will prepare you for your, you know, doing an MBA or whatever it is that you're particularly interested in. It's interesting, actually, because we did record books for Audible India at one point when they were launching into India. So it was Indian-accented English, but it did tend to be those kind of titles and they, always, they saw a huge potential for the market in the subcontinent. Yeah, and I think what has made it possible is that distribution these days is so much easier than it was with the CDs or the cassettes, let alone the, the records in the past, that it's a relatively low-cost operation to get into. And this has enabled this kind of flowering. Certainly reports I've had from students who come from Vietnam is that audiobooks they hear there are an opportunity to hear Vietnamese literature yes. talked yes. about, yes. Vietnamese traditional stories to be read, that they wouldn't perhaps hear elsewhere. So there's a way in which you could see that audiobooks are actually allowing a flowering of cultural traditions that might have lost out slightly in globalisation. I just want to go back to what something you said earlier about the students. It's, it's interesting with that about students because when I first started working with acting students in the late 90s, I would say, what do you listen to? And their only engagement was with commercial radio, rock music stations. And they never listened to any kind of form of reading or discussion. It was just those, you know, classic radio, FM, rock, you know. And that's completely turned around now, I find, because all my students now listen to podcasts and they can list any number of their favourite podcasts and they don't listen to radio. And that appointment listenership of, say, going back further, of being on the radio at 8.45 to hear the next day's chapter of the story, that's just an alien concept to people now. So the digital technology has just completely loosened that up. I think so. The other point, though, is that I think there are times when there are community events that 
a lot of people want to be part of and they want to hear from other people. They want to know that they're not alone in some situation. And the bushfires in Victoria, in other parts of Australia, would be one key situation where radio, live radio, has come to the fore. And on the one hand, people are listening for information. They want to know can I go there? I shouldn't go to this place. But also there is this sense that you're not alone in being anxious about this particular set of circumstances. And here is a presenter from the radio talking right now to you with up-to-date information and support for you in your moment of anxiety. And I think there is evidence that that is something that has kept radio operating, offering a kind of different service perhaps from uh, that that you would find with podcasts and indeed with audio books, which, which, where you have a much more one-to-one relationship between the yes. listener and the sound. And that's fine. I mean, audio is a very versatile medium. The media has lots of options available to it now. So there are different ways of engaging with listeners. Yes. Can I just tell you a little story? One of our favourite uh, narrators here, he grew up in rural Australia and when he was a small boy, he used to record himself reading his favourite stories and then at night after lights out when he was meant to be going to sleep, he'd just play it back on his little Walkman. And I just love that story, that image of that little boy in the country listening to the story under the blankets at night. Oh, I think that's gorgeous. But I think that listening to somebody read you a story is one of the most important recollections that children have of growing up and the, the closeness that they have with their parents. And oftentimes there's a physical closeness at the same time. But it's also time that is 100% given to the child. It's not, you know, talking while you're preparing a meal or talking while you're fixing the car or talking while you're doing something else. It's simply reading a story mm. for that child to listen to at that time. So it really is a, a precious gift. Yeah. Jennifer, it was a precious gift for you to come in and join us and share all this wonderful knowledge you have. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Justine. It's it's a pleasure. (laughs) You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening. <laughs>